this very special uh, occasion, which is very personal to me um, and also a milestone in the way I look at it in my life. Um, you know, before, we, before I kind of talk about the book, I wanted to share a small poem which my father gave me when I was very young and it stayed with me till, you know, the milestones that I have uh, been through in various parts of my life. And it goes, um, dreams, some are big, others just small. You've got to choose, you can't have them all. Some come true, others sadly not. A few you remember, most you forgot. Some are important, others you can live without. For some you'll have to fight, but others will be on your route. Some last a day, others a lifetime. Not only dream at night, but also at daytime. Some are possible, others are not. But you have to dream, dream on, because sometimes that's all you've got. And it's a poem which is very dear to me, because uh, I come from a small town uh, in uh, India, um, and it's up north, um, wherein uh, my parents uh, were, uh, uh, you know, they earned enough to look after their two children, but, you know, we were brought up uh, being taught about value of money. Um, we were taught up in a, we were, we were, we grew up in a little more conservative environment where there were definitions of what a girl should do and what a boy should do. And um, very often, you know, my mother, who was a doctor, but uh, would very often have to face comments like, you've got two daughters, so, you know, how are you going to look after them? And implying that, so finally, are you getting ready to get them married off? And how are you going to support them? Because, you know, finally, you know, daughters are somebody who will go to another house, and you've got to fend for them. And uh, she would often turn around and say, no, you know, I don't have a son, but my daughters will be my son. And I used to always wonder what that statement meant. Uh, I was too young to understand it, uh, but that essentially meant that my daughter will grow up, she'll stand on her two feet, she'll learn for herself and look after us. What I had a disconnect was with my daughter will be my son. I just wanted her to say my daughter will be my daughter because I just don't understand why a daughter can't do exactly what a son can do. I mean, there's no really, shouldn't be any differentiation in that. But those were the times we grew up in. And um, it was a very different environment. Uh, there were choices made. Um, and I think, you know, as I was growing up and I was seeing the world unraveling around me, there was a sense of rebellion which used to come in every time these statements used to be made. Uh, my mother was a very progressive lady, so was my dad. And we were sent off to boarding very early because my parents were moving around different locations. Um, and I grew up in a boarding school um, from year two onwards. Um, so, you know, like, uh, like a good Indian child, I was, you know, concentrating on doing something very professional. My parents being a doctor, they always dreamt that one of their daughters would pursue the same profession. Me being the elder one, um, you know, willy-nilly, um, and very subtly got saddled with that expectation. And I think all of 16 or 17, you don't know anything better. So I went through my medical exams, and um, unfortunately, not knowing how I made it, I made it. Uh, and even more unfortunately, I went, made it through the same medical college which my mother had gone to. Um, so, you know, I, as life was unraveling, I joined the school, but I think six months into the school, it, it's somewhere, you know, you kind of know it's not your calling. I was not happy, I felt that I was just not there, and I felt disengaged, and there was something not right, and I couldn't really put my finger on what it was. So in one of those breaks, I came home, had a chat with my parents and said, you know, maybe I should uh, get out of the medical school and do something different. So the question was, what's, what's that different? And the answer was, I don't know. And now that can't be really comforting for parents when you say, oh, I actually I don't want to pursue medicine, but I want to do something different, which I don't know, I'll figure it out. So we, as you can imagine, we went through a huge emotional upheaval at home. And, um, you know, my mother couldn't really understand my perspective. I couldn't understand her perspective. My father desperately trying to mediate between two women in his life. Um, however, you know, I prevailed and uh, I decided to pursue psychology. And uh, that was the first big choice that I made about my life. And I wasn't sure it was going to happen or it was going to work. I just knew that I didn't want to do something else. Um, but there was a risk. 
And it, there was a possibility that if I pursued psychology, I may get something professional, I may not. But I think over a period of time, I discovered that when you pursue your passion, excellence at some level follows. And I think as I got into studying that subject, I kind of fell in love with it, and the rest became history, and that's where I kind of pursued my profession in HR, which was very much by choice and not by accident. So I think writing this book has been a very special journey for me because it's very reflective. I have relived a lot of my moments and a lot of my life uh, events. I have experienced the same emotions every time I was writing a passage or writing events, good or not so good, especially the not so good. Because I remember I was writing um, something in chapter five. I have to leave a few mysterious uh, you know, nuggets here. So something in chapter five, which is about courage. And I was reminiscing about my time spent in Europe or New York and what I faced as uh, as not just as a woman, but also as a South Asian woman. Because we come from a society which is much more patriarchal. And you know, how do you exert yourself? How do you get yourself you know, known? Or how do you just speak up? Is not something which comes very naturally, because you're not encouraged to do that from the start. So there were moments where you know, I was living through some of those uh, incidents, and I could actually experience that emotion flowing through my heart all over again. So it has been a marvelous journey of going through my life all over again and actually looking at it with a lens, magnifying things and relearning and saying, this is what I did right. This is what I didn't get right. This is what I could have prevented. But hey, never mind. How do I make it work going forward? So that's why it's a very special journey for me. You know, I stand with a lot of mixed emotions today, uh, some excitement, some joy, some anxiety, and you know, obviously anticipating some reactions which I'm going to get from you. Uh, but most importantly, with a lot of gratitude about what life has endowed on me. Uh, a lot of gratitude for Dunya for you know, getting me here and you know, making me interact with fabulous audience like yourself. Um, a lot of gratitude for people who mentored my journey uh, my family, my friends, uh, some of them are in the audience. Um, because you know, I think each one of them has contributed to how this journey shaped up. So this is not my story. This is their story. This is your story. And as I was talking to some of you just you know, over uh, drinks, that this is not a story of somebody who's achieved it. This is not a story of you know, people who've got it all right. This is just an ordinary stro story about different things which unfolded, which made the journey very extraordinary. And it's, you know, I've captured moments even for, for people who worked with me in my team. So it's on a lighter note, you know, when this book was published in India and my team started to read it, they're like, oh, so this one is this and this one is this. And they felt quite excited that, you know, we were talking about them. But I think the whole intent is to get their stories out and some reactions from them. So for me, you know, it had been on my mind for a while uh, because of you know, the interactions I've had in my work experience uh, with women across different geographies. Uh, what triggered it was actually I was really unwell once. And uh, you know, I had a double bout of uh, pneumonia. Uh, it was fairly fatal. And I was hospitalized for four months in London. And there was one particular night where the doctor said, OK, this is it, 24 hours, get her family in. And my parents flew down. And they suspected that my organs were failing. So I was taken into a chamber, uh, which was a steel chamber, where they scan your entire body and your bone structure to see how far the disease has inflicted on you. I was very weak. You know, I barely could breathe because my lungs were you know, completely um, snowed down with fluids. Um, and I was taken into this chamber, which I was ironically like a coffin. I was put in, and the scanner was going up and down on my body. I was, you know, I was thinking about it, and I'm feeling claustrophobic, as you can see. But um, the point was that, you know, I was obviously in tears, and I was very stressed. And the physician, who was a very nice English gentleman next to me, he he knew exactly, or he could feel my anxiety, a huge amount of anxiety. You know, I don't know whether I'm going to live after this. And he said, just close your eyes and think about what you would do when you get out of this room. Um, and make a list of things, what you would do. So think positive. And I did close my eyes, because the whole steel plate comes right onto your face. And as I closed my eyes, I could only see my two little children, who were then all of four and nine, playing around in Regent's Park, and you know, calling out. 
And at some level, you know, it started to fester on me that have I done it all? You know, maybe I've been a very successful, ambitious woman. You know, I've tried to traverse, get a breadth of exposure in different continents, have a fulfilled motherhood. It didn't occur to me about what would happen to my husband, which he never forgave me for. But uh, that's, that's what really happened. And, uh, you know, there was that pull factor. And, um, you know, I came back. And I remember as I was taken out of that chamber, and I think as I was so unwell, though, you know, doctors were yet fighting on, you know, whether they could save me or not save me. You know, I'd send messages out to my office and saying, you know, I don't know. Nobody knew how grave it was, but I said, I'm going to be out for a while. So somebody should come and take over the job that I was doing. And I remember the call that I got back from the gentleman that I used to work with. He used to be with us. His name was Tom King. And he called me back and said, you know, how are you? And, you know, inquiring on my health, and I could barely speak. And I said, I don't know, you know. And it, 2009 is the peak of financial crisis. So there's a lot which is going on in the markets. And here I am looking after HR for corporate and investment bank at that point of time. And I said, I don't know what's happening, but I don't know when I'll be back. So you should move on. And I remember it very vividly. He turned around and said, you know what? You'll be back. This is June of 2009. You'll be back. We are fully confident you'll be back. And don't, don't make it too late, because compensation process starts in November. So make sure you get here in time. But I think there were lots of these messages which came in from different relationships which were critical and important to me. And I do believe, my doctors don't know how I got back, because actually I went for bronchoscopy, and they washed my lungs, and I got OK. But the bronchoscopy is usually a diagnostic procedure. It's not supposed to heal you. So I did get OK, and I think somewhere the will to come back and somewhere people wanting me to come back, a combination of that is here, and I'm right in front of you talking about my story. Um, but it was um, surreal, and my physicians told me, it doesn't matter how you got okay, Mrs. Kumar, what's important is you are okay, and now keep it that way. So I think that triggered the thought to do something. I wasn't able to do it whilst in London, and then I returned to India, and as I you know, as I kind of observed people around me, I realized there were a lot of, both men and women, struggling with different issues, but women more so. And I think the multiplicity of demands, both domestic and, uh, you know, at work, especially if you're pursuing a career, was just unnerving very often. And that's what got me thinking about how you make your choices and what really makes you happy. I know it's a very philosophical question, but a very important one at that. And I started thinking about choices, and um, you know, and I figured that as far as the world of women is concerned, you know, we often are unsure about what makes us happy. We are always so focused on what makes everybody else around us happy. So it's nice to be giving, but unless you take care of yourself and your happiness, you know, you can't make others happy. So this book is not about you know, saying a oh, career is to be, or career women is the way to go, because there are lots of homemakers. And homemaker is a full-time job as well, which I think is often undervalued by just giving a thank you card on a Mother's Day. But <clears throat> you know, they're happy with their choices. So I think I have a lot of respect for those women, because they might have given up other choices in their life to be at home, because that's what they feel fulfilled about. Then there are you know, chaotic people like me, who say, well, I want to, you know, I want to work, and of course I want to be in my children's PTA, and I want to be going out with my husband, I want to do it all. It's chaotic, it's not ideal sometimes, but it's optimal, it works. And I'm happy with the choices I make. But then there is a bunch of women who make these choices, whether to work because they want it, you know, they, they, they're financially driven, and they have to work because of finances, or they don't work because Either there are social cultural factors at play, or there are um, you know, other issues in terms of having support at home for various reasons. And it's really a huge quantum of those women which you know, I wanted to reach out to. And just you know, reiterate these stories of various people, and if in any way it relates to them, uh, you know, I think this effort would have been fulfilled. So for me, I think three things stand out, which is you know, most of the career women which, which they face were you know, which I faced as well, which is around marriage, uh, maternity, and mobility. So for me, you know, I kind of graduated. I <coughs> joined uh, PNG from once I finished my business management. Uh, my husband to be, who I found along the way, uh, joined Unilever. And as you can imagine, we started having a bit of an issue at home, whether we use Arial or we use Surf Excel. And for the sake of my marital bliss, at some point of time, 
both Sandeep and I had to decide who's going to pursue with which companies. And also, as you know, they're big competitors. And I think at some level, it would have become a bit of a career limiting move. The good part was it was never that, OK, you have to leave because we're getting married. It was both of us went out in the market. And I'm proud to say maybe I was more employable then. You know, I moved on to city with the job that I wanted to do, and the rest is history. But the, but the funny part about that career change because of the marriage, impending marriage, was that it took us to two different cities. He was in Mumbai then, and I was in Delhi. And therein started our tries to with a two-city marriage, which has been a recurrence, uh, you know, which has been a recurring event in our life as well. <coughs> so we got married, and um, we had, uh, you know, two kids. And uh, as I happened to have my first one when I was just, you know, getting into middle management in city, um, I was not sure what I was in for, for sure. Um, but, you know, I was at that point of time. You know, it's, it's for women most of the time, having a baby and, you know, kicking off your career, that crossroad comes together. And it is a tricky one because it's a difficult choice to make about what you want to go through. And there are n number of, you know, incidents that I've talked about in the book, but, you know, relating to mine, so when I had my first one, um, it was, um, you know, I was, I was very worked up about what am I coming back to, because I was very clear I was coming back to something. I had given this profession a lot, I had given my, my work was a passion, it was also part of who I was. So I had to come back to who I was. And I kept persisting, saying, what am I coming back to? And there was, you know, you go back, you figure out how life is going to be after baby will decide. Fair enough. So I had a baby. I came back after four or five months when my maternity leave was over, and I requested what my assignment's going to be. Now, as you know, in, in, a big, in a big corporate, things take time to work out. So I was put onto some project, uh, valuable projects, but not a very you know, strictly defined outline of what I was going to do. Um, a month, two months, three months, and then I started to get frustrated because I really didn't have a job, and I thought maybe this is the end of my career. Uh, because, you know, I've taken this break and maybe I'll never recover from it. So I went to my boss and I had a very tough discussion, which was, which went like, you know, if you have a real job, let's talk about it. Otherwise, there is, it's not really worth my time leaving a four month at ho old at home and coming back and doing something which I really don't like. And here was the irony of the situation. My manager thought he was actually being nice to me by letting me on a lighter, quote unquote, lighter job so that it's flexible for me to go and look after the baby. The problem was he forgot to ask me whether I really wanted that. And I don't, I really, I mean, I'm actually very grateful because I think he was trying to be very caring. But the point was that maybe every woman is not the same. Maybe every woman doesn't want to take that break. Maybe every woman wants to make it work slightly differently. And I also realized that on my part, maybe I should have communicated that a little more clearly and a little more efficiently. So I think it was a crossroad, and very often, even in city, we see a lot of women would take this break, and then you know they have to find their feedback. Not just in city, I find that is a constant issue or a constant debate when we talk about diversity and inclusion uh, across many other corporates. So that was the second crossroad, and the third one being mobility. Uh, we're a dual working couple, and uh, you know I've moved around different countries across the world. Sometimes my husband followed me, sometimes I followed him. And you know, I will go back to the two-city marriage, which my parents really struggled to understand. So did his, actually. Um, and a couple of incidents in my life when you know I was working in London, and you know this was our, just after I had come back after this whole fatal attack of pneumonia, and uh, my husband decided to change his job and go back to India with an assignment he really, really wanted to do. So there was a conflict because I don't want to go back at that point of time, and he did, <coughs> and we debated that for a while. And after some very sensible and mature discussion, which our parents never understood, we decided to split family. For, uh, you know, and we had two kids uh, who were about, thank you, who were about uh, you know, 7 and 11 at that point of time. We had two children. And uh, I was a bit nervous, I have to confess. I was a bit nervous because I wasn't sure how this was going to work. We'd done two cities before, you know, when we moved to other countries. But we didn't have kids then. But we took it in our stride. And um, you know he moved, and I stayed back. And then you know we decided to move the children after a while, which became even tougher because you know without kids, I was I was feeling a bit stranded. But I think when you want something really badly, everybody around you tries to help you and make it work. And that's what happened. 
Um, my mother, of course, thought for a while that I had gone a bit nuts because, you know, I had just, you know, come out of this illness. Now I wanted to stay back in London. Sandeep was coming back. And she wasn't sure what we were trying to do here. But, you know, when she saw the determination of both of us trying to make it work, she stepped up to the plate as well to look after my children when they went back to India. Uh, my organization stepped up. It wasn't easy because, you know, I was traveling back and forth between Delhi, London for a while. And, you know, trying to do a European job in the midst of financial crisis, you know, half time you're in India and then you're in London isn't easy. It takes a huge amount of understanding with the people that you work. And I think you give it your best shot. You work as hard as you can, not just hard, I think smarter as well. You try and make things work, you become a little more efficient, you become a little more effective. But as I undertook this journey, I think it was, some, it was one of those things which, uh, when it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And there were really tough moments. You know, there were moments when my son would be unwell, and I wanted to run back, and I couldn't. Uh, and I would be, you know, feeling guilty whether, you know, I'm doing the right thing, I'm doing the wrong thing, you know, should I pursue this path? And, you know, I needed that assurance from my extended family that this, this you know, this shall pass. Uh, there were moments where my children didn't want me to go back to London because they would miss me. But, you know, as time passed by, I think we all got used to a certain way of life, which may seem very, um, you know, very different to somebody from outside. But we grew up like that. And today, you know, I'm very proud when my 17-year-old daughter turns around and tells me, hey, mom, I'm really glad you never gave up work for me because I won't know how to live with that guilt. And, uh, you know, so, and she feels proud about the fact that, you know, I do what I do. And somewhere, I think it all starts to come together. So I think it's been a journey. It's been a journey of uh, evolution. It's been a journey, a bit of revolution. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been a fulfilling and a learning journey for me. I think through this journey, uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned, you know, as I transcended different um, ladders of the corporate world, um, you know, you realize that as a, as a woman, as you're growing through the ranks, um, there are different kinds of stereotypes, which may be, uh, or stereotypical lens that you may be viewed through. And I was talking to somebody in the audience outside, and I said, very often as you're growing through the ladder, an uh, ambitious, driven woman is perceived negatively. By the way, both by men and women. That's my own belief, or that's my own experience. Whereas an ambitious, driven man is always perceived positively, because it's a trait which is associated positively with men. And I think we've all had to go through these journeys. I think working as a South Asian in different parts of the world, I had to go through a cultural transition as well. And on a lighter note, you know, when I kind of was working with investment banking, and I remember you know, walking into a management team once, or a management team the first time to introduce myself, and I looked around the table, there were a bunch of you know, 30, 40 white males, 45 and above. So I just looked around and I said, you know, I kind of add color from every perspective on this table. Uh, because, you know, talk about making a difference, Rajiv. So I think, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been great. It's been a huge eye opener for somebody who started her journey up north India from a small town, you know, traversing across the world, being able to relate back uh, to, you know, what happened to different people along the journey. But the, the last thing I want to share is, for me, men have been a very significant part of my journey, not just my husband. But I think um, a lot of my mentors, a lot of my sponsors, um, I think beyond a point, you know, when, you, when they know you're trying hard and you're truly trying hard, I've had a lot of men support me through this journey. My best mentors have been men. And I've truly benefited from their guidance and experiences. And I think it is also for the women to step up the game. Very often I've found that women at mid-level or junior le or senior level <coughs> excuse me, uh, tend to say, well, it's getting very tough, or it's getting very complicated, it's getting very political, I don't know how to navigate this corporate maze, and tend to give up. They also tend to give up because sometimes they're not the bread earner. What if you were? What if your husband wanted to be at home? So I think sometimes because society gives women the choices to sit at home, are we using that too liberally? It's just a question I want to ask. It's not, it's not something I want to impose. But I've, I've learned a lot, and you know, the few thoughts I want to leave you with, one is, you know, as I ran through my life, I realized it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So take things in your stride. There will be highs, there will be lows. Uh, don't plan short, don't plan long, plan medium. And medium means 18 to 24 months, that's what I do. Um, 
I've realized that failures are the biggest lessons. Um, you know, I've fallen flat on my face sometimes in different geographies I've worked. I didn't get it right. You know, sometimes I just, you know, in, in a big world where they're, which was predominantly male, especially when I was working in banking, um, sometimes I didn't get it right in terms of the interactions. I didn't know how to go about networking. I didn't know how to create connects. Uh, and I, I, you know, maybe lost a promotion because of that. But, you know, I bounced back. And uh, what I said earlier, you know, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. And that's what happened with each of these failures. So success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's just the courage to keep continuing is what carries on. And finally, I would say believe in yourself uh, and take a bet on yourself. Because if you don't, then who else will? So I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Thank you very much. We're Dunia. We do things differently.